Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Deadliest Warrior podcast. I'm your host today, Craig Taylor, joined by my co-host, Lucas, <laughs> and Matt Davis. Woo! Yes. Hey, me and the boys out here marching in the desert, son. Right. Call us. Uh, I'm gonna earn. I'm gonna earn my Kepe Blanc <laughs> one of these days. Right. Yo, how's your oxygen content? High. <laughs> <laughs> not as high as some <laughs> higher than most um, higher than most yeah and then also as always in the ones and twos we got Brendan hello yeah so we have what I think is a much anticipated episode French Foreign Legion versus Gurkhas what are those yeah. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I take the intro here sure on, uh, the Gurkhas the fearless mountain assassins who take on the British Empire's most dangerous missions versus the French Foreign Legion, the elite army of real-life expendables that France sends to do its dirty work. Yeah, I feel like those intros get longer and longer every episode. Real-life expendables. (laughs) You knew the jig was up for the French as soon as that intro happened. Yeah. And also, on the topic of the intro, um, they say, I think it's Mac... Or Jeff, I don't know. For the first time on Deadliest Warrior, these warriors were not born in the country that they're fighting for, which I thought is an interesting premise. I, I can't say it adds that much to the matchup, but, you know, it's a little, little fun fact. Let me just get started with initial impressions, of at least what you remember from this, this episode. I did not watch this. This is my first time watching this episode because I it kind of started clicking for me. During the... Back for Back, which, as we established last episode, this played back-to-back with Zombies vs. Vampires. I, like, was late to watching it. I think I texted you guys. I was like, did I miss anything? And you guys were like, no, nah, not really. <laughs> and I didn't bother watching it. Um, and so this was all new. And it was exciting to watch a new Deadliest Warrior episode, basically. So, um, But obviously not really any core memories, except for Nick Hughes, which obviously we'll get to. I, like, vaguely remembered him. Uh, Lucas, what did you remember about this? Uh, raise your hand if you didn't know what a Gurkha or the French Foreign Legion was like 48 hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about where. Yeah, I'm at. yeah that was, was uh... that was a recurring theme with this episode was that nobody knew who these guys were. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, now I will say when I watched this way back in the day, I did know who the French Foreign Legion was but I had no idea what the Gurkhas were, you know, what a Gurkha was. And I went into it thinking, ah, the, the Legion's going to wipe the floor with these guys. You know, it's like the Gurkhas, who? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, first time I learned about the Gurkhas from the show, this show has an embarrassingly high amount of first times for me. You know, like uh, when I'm hearing about these warriors for the first time. Mm. (laughs) All of season Um, three. (laughs) But yeah, I remember you guys both being like, yeah, I don't know who these guys are. And uh, I was telling people about the episode we're doing this week. And I'm like, French Foreign Legion versus Gurkhas. And they're like, the fuck is that, dude? (laughs) All those people in North Carolina. (laughs) What the hell's a Gurkha? Man, everyone was fighting over the guest spot on this episode. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Matt's telling the random, like, he'll be at the gas station. Hey, what the hell's a Gurkha? (laughs) (laughs) Um, They just glance over to, yeah, two groups of people that, like, fighting for, you know, some major world power that just kind of contracts them, dying for a country they don't even live in. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, real quick, I'll just add in, Dorian, he says that the Gurkhas live in the oxygen-deprived Himalayas, and it gives them a tactical edge. And right away, you know, this is going to be fucking the crux of the whole episode, is this oxygen thing. It's like what they latch on to. Yeah. Jealous? (laughs) So, it's definitely a meme... It's a season three, like, you know, let's drop some obscure X factor and make it like, you know, this matchup is so close that this one little thing tipped it over the edge. But I find it hard to complain about the blood oxygen thing because 
compared to some of the other shit they've tried to skedaddle past us, uh, I was like, well, at least this is like real. And you could put it as the stamina stat. It's it's easily representable. They just have more yeah, stamina. You, you can understand how it would go into like a computer game, mm-hmm. like how that would be represented. You know, it's it's interesting. I guess I don't really know. Like the French Foreign Legion is so you know, well-conditioned and trained. So you kind of think like, well, how much of a difference could it really make? But the science is there. And so I don't know. I, I, for once I'm kind of like, you know, Matt, maybe you just need to shut your mouth (laughs) on this one. And, uh, you know, you maybe know, if we're lucky, ar- argue some different points. Maybe if we're lucky, there might be some uh, health notes on this at some point oh, during the show. Nice. Lucas okay. is like actually living in the Himalayas. Makes you uh, <laughs> makes your lungs worse. That's why this episode actually took so long to come out. I actually traveled to the Himalayas oh, yeah. and then uh, measured my blood oxygen. I as well. I went to the uh, Forbidden Mountain <laughs> and I found uh, the Yeti. He but the Yeti was not moving. <laughs> Shout out if you I went down to the gas station and polled the local yokels about uh you know, because everybody in the city of Raleigh sounds like this. Uh, and I was like, What do you think? FFLs or Gurkhas? And they're like, Who? Yeah. <laughs> I went over to uh, you know, Nepal and then I'm like, Oh fuck, I'm not even supposed to be here. <laughs> All right, All right, let's let's, let's, stay okay, so let's rein it in. So, <laughs> someone will know what that's from. Yeah, Matt. Um, <laughs> yeah. I will say this episode is definitely for the fans in that I think that for the hardcore history people, I'm talking to you guys watching that recommend these obscure ass people, I have no idea who the fuck they are. That these people should be on Deadliest Warrior season four. This episode is for you because I feel like you got to be a history fan to know who the hell these people are. Um, so I think it was maybe a love letter to those people um, of like, okay, we'll fold and do these like relatively obscure warriors. Do you think they knew season four was not happening at this point? <laughs> I don't think so. Because again, remember the last aftermath, they were talking about season four like it was a possibility. Yeah. This would have been filmed already, but. Oh, man. Um, they're, listen, they're rolling the dice at this point on vampire versus yeah. zombie. Yeah. But that is the last we're going to mention that episode because I. I will say this episode, my overall impressions, I was like, it's decent. I enjoyed it. I thought the tests were fine. The outcome was fine. Um, And I found myself like, I found it being overshadowed a little bit by the fact that uh, I went to watch the aftermath and I remembered, oh, this aired double uh, alongside the vampire episode. And then I just remembered thinking like, I started thinking about all the things I thought about that episode, and I was like, got to stay on track. Got to stay on track. (laughs) Yeah, you can't let that overshadow this. Yeah, I said it off camera, but I want to say it on camera. This is the last real episode of the show, pretty much. Yeah, the penultimate. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But I wanted to ask as maybe a prompt, why do you guys think we haven't heard of either of these warriors before? Well, I don't know. Speak for yourself, man. (laughs) Um, probably just because a realistic answer from me here is probably just because um, I don't know the French Foreign Legion, but uh, the Gurkhas like aren't very high in numbers, and you know I'm not from Britain, so I don't really know too much about Britain's army, I guess. Yeah. But I mean the Gurkhas, uh, they were really prevalent during like the World Wars, but after that their numbers are pretty significantly low. I think like active there's like three thousand five hundred right now, so it's a pretty like exclusive group. So. Not that well known, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Wow. You want to get into some stats, Craig? <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, was my next section of stats. So, start with the French Foreign Legion, circa 1940, 1945, age 27, height 5 foot 8, weight 155 pounds. The Gurkhas, circa 1940, 1945, same time frame, age 19, a lot younger, 5'3", weight 135 pounds. Um, maybe we use this as our introduction to each of these warriors. They're little guys, but they're ferocious. Yeah, yeah Dorian calls the Gurkhas <laughs> little again, which we, we both said 
make that a drinking game yeah, this episode. Take a shot every time. Every time <laughs> they make a joke about Gurkhas being little. Um, but yeah, Matt, let, start us out. Give us your background on the French Foreign Legion. Yeah, well, before that, I would like to add that uh, the 5-3-135 stat, I'm pretty sure we have commented on many times. They love Anytime there's an Asian warrior on the show, they love making him 135 pounds. <laughs> That's like their go-to thing. It's like the samurai, the Shaolin, Sun Tzu himself. Like, you know, this, he was 135 pounds. We know that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I thought it was also interesting because they're contrasting making the French Foreign Legion bigger, but it's like they're only like five foot eight and uh, represented by Nick in here. Nick, they, they say like three quarters of the way through the episode, they're like, Nick is six foot nine. <laughs> it's like, okay. oh, that's why everybody looks so small. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's like, big show. Yeah, he is like the big show, yeah. Um, uh, what is it? Also, during the Robert Daly intro, we get to see the hidden X-Factors. Um, you know, we I, ever since I discovered these, these are... Uh, this is what I look forward to every episode. So, the Legion's hidden X-Factors, uh, they have two. Discipline and anonymity. So... Discipline, I would imagine, is some kind of morale boost. Uh, and uh, anonymity, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what is it? What, how does it translate? I guess they're, uh, Flash Fox Full was suggesting maybe they're like more expendable. Um, and I guess it's as good as the any. Gur- the Gurkhas are listed. It says they have high oxygen blood. <laughs> And their other X factor is courage. <laughs> you know, the other thing is Robert Daly also says that the Gurkhas being natural born warriors and the French Foreign Legion being trained will quote play a big factor. In fact, I don't think yes. it played any factor whatsoever. If so, I had to guess. So they they don't. Okay, I have a note about this later in the episode with a specific comment that's made. I don't think they're intending this. I think they're trying to get across like that the Gurkhas have a tradition, you know, a cultural uh, thing about being a warrior. But in this episode, the way they talk about it sounds so like race science. Like they're constantly like, I think at one point the, uh, the Gurkha expert, that's the British dude um, says, uh, and these little guys are bred for obedience. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get. I want to cover that when we get to it. Yeah. I, I have notes okay. on that. Yeah, we were talking All about right. that I'm exact I'm glad I wasn't earlier. the only one to notice because it was very much like uh, I watched. Uh, I rewatched Django Unchained not that long ago, and there's the phrenology scene where Leo, uh, Leo's char- Leo DiCaprio's character is like doing the fake like skull science and he's like and you see this dimple right here now and that, that, that's where the, the african-american is more obedient now yeah <laughs> and that's I, I know he didn't mean it but when the british dude was like they are bred for obedience you won't believe the orders these little guys will take from us <laughs> i was like oh my god right. um <laughs> uh and before i get into i don't have too much history uh, about them because it's one of those things where there's so much that I was just like, I'm going to summarize it. Um, I have to give a shout out to Flash Fox Full, who all the way back in December of last year sent us uh, his whole write up for this episode. And um, I saw it, I put it away, and I didn't look at it until. Uh, Many, you know, many, many months later, after I had written my notes. And so I wrote my notes and then I looked at his and he's got plenty of stuff that, uh, you know, I, I hadn't seen or found. So I'm going to scatter it throughout. I don't want to have to source his site every single time I, I say something that he put in there. So I'm just going to give an upfront thank you uh, that we all looked at that document and we all sort of pulled some stuff from it um 
Now, as far as the Foreign Legion goes, so their rep and how they're sort of portrayed, portrayed in this episode is the Legion, it's a place where outcasts and criminals go to start a new life. You know, because they're foreigners, uh, the French people don't care. And the same ethical standards aren't really applied to the Gurkhas. So training is like brutal and harsh. On the show, they say their training has more deaths than any other military program in the world. I didn't bother to look into that because like, I feel like that's a kind of an impossible stat. Because it's only going to be how high some of these countries decide. Like, who knows what North Korea's you know, training fatalities are. Like, we don't have the numbers on that. Um, the French Foreign Legion was established by the King of France, Louis-Philippe I, in 1831. Since then, their reputation has grown as they have served in conflicts all over the globe. Um, they show a map at one point, a, pat a patented season three map where they're highlighting all the countries that the Foreign Legion has been in. And uh, as I'm scrolling through their history, I'm like, wow, all the they were in all of these countries. Um, so there's a cool side to it. And there's also, you know... <sighs> There's a more cynical way of looking at the Foreign Legion in that this is a colonial power, right, that is taking what you have to assume. I'll put it this way. You probably don't have a lot of, like, well-off, rich people signing up for the French Foreign Legion, right? They're taking advantage the way, like, militaries everywhere do by offering, like, economic incentive. And then they're taking sort of troops from the places France is colonized, you know, and they accept from everywhere. And then they deploy them to do military missions in their colonies, you know? So it's almost like making people police themselves in a way. And, you know, I watched a number of like just free YouTube documentaries where they're showing footage of these guys in training. And I watched some for the Gurkhas as well. And sort of an unspoken thing in this episode, because this episode's very very much presenting it as, like, it's all about valor. You know, these people are warriors, and they want to fight, and they want a chance to, you know, bring honor or something. There's a huge economic part of this. Like, the Gurkha video I watched was wild, um, because the Gurkhas are this respected unit, but so many young uh, men in Nepal sign up to do that because it's like it's one of the only ways they can make enough money to support a family like if you can get in the Gurkhas you're making a British military salary and you have access to certain benefits so these kids at like 18 19 come in and they try to get in you know um, and the French Foreign Legion's the same way uh, after three years of service, you're able to apply for French citizenship. And um, there's also a really cool clause that says if you get injured in combat, you uh, can automatically become a French citizen. And it's called, the clause is referred to as French by spilled blood. <laughs> which I thought sounded pretty epic. Um, and, you know, they give you a salary. They give you a place to live. They teach you how to speak French. This is a doorway if you're someone living in, uh, you know, one of these African nations that France has occupied forever. Um, this is a chance for you to get your foot in the door and, like, become a French citizen, which could improve your life and 
the lives of a lot of people in your life. And I think it's important to recognize sort of the the economic factors that go into both these groups of warriors. Um, to quote System of a Down, you know, why do they always send the poor? Right? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's interesting with the french foreign legion they're like this almost like pulp hero bad company suicide squad you know what i mean like yes yeah god damn it yeah <laughs> they are they are like those things like this this image of you know this ragtag i mean they're basically i kept thinking about you know i'm a big song of ice and fire fan they're the night's watch from game of thrones like you know when a when a man takes the black his the sins of his past are wiped clean <laughs> you, know? you you belong to the watch now you know you belong to the legion now um and there is something to be said for that kind of brotherhood uh it's it's just interesting and you know it does make for some pretty brutal uh, war- training and they do get sent to do some of the shitty missions like a suicide squad kind of um, because hey these are just a bunch of foreigners right With the French we can just throw these guys in there and if every single one of them dies you know the, the news isn't even going to talk about it probably <laughs> here's a question if the French Foreign Legion are suicide squad who is Nick Hughes? Margot Robbie. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know you know, what's else. funny is uh, the, the movie I picked for the Legion has an actor who played Killer Croc and Suicide Squad in it. Uh-huh. But um, <laughs> did, did you say Nick Hughes would be Margot Robbie? <laughs> yeah. No, I changed my answer. <laughs> um, who's the shark guy? Because isn't Nick like a, a diver King, or something by King trade? Shark. King yeah, Shark. Yeah, King Shark. That's my answer. Yeah, yeah, King Shark. Um, I would say the know, the professor out. guy is Jared Leto's Joker, the Jorker. Okay, yeah. Uh, in that he's annoying every time he talks. <laughs> I wish he was off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dorian is a dead shot. Um, yeah, Dor- Dorian is dead shot. What? <laughs> All right, let's, let's get back on the yeah, right. The the one guy's Cara Delevingne's character, mm-hmm. the en- Enchantress, El Diablo. Right, sorry, let's hear about the Gurkhas. Yeah. I'm sorry, Lucas. <laughs> yeah, get us get your Gurk on. Sure. <laughs> Gurk Gurk off. Oh yeah, I like that Gurk. <laughs> So I wanted to know where uh, Gurkha even comes from to begin with. I think they talk about it a little bit on the show, but... Um, Fun thing to say. Gurkha. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It comes from the hill town of Gorkha, which is where the Nepalese kingdom have expanded from. <laughs> uh, essentially, it's the origin, uh, origins of the Nepalese kingdom. So they touch about this on the show. Great Britain, they're in. Uh, they're trying to invade Nepal around... <laughs> I could just see Matt I'm laughing. Sorry, I don't know why I thought that was so funny. It just sounds like a fucking made up fact. You're like, Gurkha, they originally come from the town Gorka. <laughs> well, what do you want? People aren't that creative. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the British East India Company, they're, uh, they're messing around Nepal back in like 1815. And uh, they start getting into some fights with these with these native people. And they get their ass absolutely handed to them. So in Great Britain's you know typical fashion, what do they do? They're like, let's take these guys and just use them as warriors. Instead of, you know, just properly admitting defeat. So that's how the, uh, the Gurkhas pretty much come to be. They, um, they signed that peace deal. It was like 1815. I think it got ratified in 1816. And then they recruited their former enemies into service. Since then, they have uh, loyally fought for Britain all over the world. And uh, the company itself has earned 13 Victoria Crosses. I don't really know what that is, but that's something pretty high. I, isn't that like the equivalent of like the Medal of Honor or something? I, I don't know for a fact, but it is. I have heard of it. It's like a you know high up medal in the British... Uh, uh, Named after Queen Victoria herself. <laughs> oh, chip, Boy. chip, cheerio. Here you go. Fight for us and we'll give you a medal. Uh, they've been All right, part so of the... we've got... In... 
bad southern accent, bad British accent. I will be doing a terrible French accent later. Don't worry. <laughs> so they've uh, they've been part of the British Army for 200 years as of 2015. Fought famously um, that I just learned 48 hours ago in both world wars. They hit their peak of 112,000 men in, uh, I think it was World War II. 43,000 of them died. Forty, Yeah, 43,000 of them lost their lives in World War II. Uh, I think I said it earlier, their number's around 3,500 today, so it's a pretty elite squadron. There's um, a lot of people trying to get into that position, and there's just not many open positions now. Their motto is, better to die than to be a coward. Pretty manly. I'm going to get that tatted on my arm after the show. They serve in various roles, but mainly infantry. Some serve in like engineering, logistics, and signal specialists. They keep their Nepalese customs and beliefs and still perform the religious festivals, such as Dashain, where goats and buffaloes are sacrificed and they go back to Nepal to do that. Their selection process is said to be one of the toughest in the world. Potential crews have to do stuff such as running uphill for 40 minutes, carrying a basket with 70 pounds of rocks, 75 yes. bench jumps. Yeah, I don't know if you wrote this, Lucas. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I thought they have a very unique thing where they have to hold the basket with the yeah. top of their head. Yeah, they like and weave it's based the basket. Like... It's like Master Roshi training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Okay, Brennan, we have our first fact track. Is fucking, what's his face? Is Grim from Siege or Gurkha? He's got like the hat. I think he's from Singapore. But like a little the hat, you know, there's got to be some Gurkha um, overlap. He's Gurkin, like a little bit, right? Yeah, he's he's, <laughs> he's a Gurk. Um, but yeah, to continue, sorry. Yeah, sure. Some of their other stuff they have to do 75 bench jumps. Not really sure what that is, but they got to do 75 of them in one minute. I think, I think that's just jumping up and landing on a bench. 70 sit ups in two minutes. Uh, some serious, strenuous physical tests are required each year there's around 10,000 applicants who try out and there's around 240 to 400 uh, spots per year for them to so it's, you know they cut down on the nose numbers, uh, numbers significantly those who are chosen to serve um, they serve a maximum of 30 years but there's a minimum of 15 to secure a pension with the British government so you still got to put in a lot of time it's a little bit more of a crap deal than your three years to get French citizenship <laughs> My guy's got to do a 15. Chan- you can apply for French oh, okay. citizenship. And then so they do have the and right like, to oh, throw oh, your no, ass no, to the no. <laughs> You know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I did confirm the Victoria Cross is the highest and most prestigious decoration of the British honor system. So you are right, Lucas. There we go. Yeah, they got 13 of them. My, my granddad has three Victoria Crosses. <laughs> It did. <laughs> what about the Battle of Gloucestershire? <laughs> <laughs> so, as of very recently, retired Gurkhas are now able to acquire the right to live in the United Kingdom because apparently for like 200 years they weren't even allowed to live in like the United Kingdom after their service was done. But this was led a movement led by actress Joanna Lumley, whose father served with the Gurkhas. Um, this is well earned as the Gurkhas have a famous reputation of being very brave, tough, and loyal, even in the fiercest battles. They've served pretty much all conflicts that Britain's been involved in. Um, a branch of them also serves the Indian Army as well now. So I guess there was some kind of like peace treaty deal going on where some of the Gurkhas were transferred to the Indian Army. So about the, um, oh, like, like you said too, I did watch a couple of the videos on their training. Pretty intense. If you want to look on YouTube, there's... Um, there's videos of like uh, kind of survive in the cut type deal where you can just check out what their training looks like and some of the selection process. So the uh, about the height, because I'm just going to address that elephant in the room now. Okay. Uh, it's actually talked about frequently online, and apparently their average height has increased with increased medical care and higher quality of food that many of them have been able to bring back to Nepal through the service. As Matt said, they kind of get like a you know, this is one of the best ways for them to make money and support their family, essentially. Um, many people who live in these hill villages of Nepal are around five foot four. But uh, to serve in the Gurkhas, they have a minimum height requirement of 158 centimeters, which is five foot two and a minimum weight of 50 kilograms. So uh, 
yeah, you could do some more research on them. I don't want to get too long winded, but that's the uh, the Gurkhas in a nutshell. Nice. Yeah, Lucas. The one documentary I watched was su- super British, and so they're giving every they're giving all the measurements and like you know metrics and stuff. And <laughs> they're talking about the Gurkha training ground, and they, the guy says. It's this many hectares. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's this many crumpets. <laughs> uh, do you want to touch on the red blood cells now? Yeah, let's just do it. Yeah, the red the red blood it's cells. Critical. Let's, it's critical. let's talk about some uh some can't blood live, cells. Can't here. live without them. <laughs> yeah. Uh Nepal has an average elevation of ten thousand seven hundred and twelve feet. Rip that straight off like Wikipedia. Uh that's above sea level. And it's the country with the second highest elevation in the world. You want to know what the first highest is? I don't know. I didn't look it up. Some of the mountains in Nepal stretch to like... Isn't Nepal where uh, the freaking Mount Mount Everest Everest is? Yeah. (laughs) How is is that not the highest? Well, that's like average elevation. There's a country that has a... I'm sure it's like some small country somewhere, probably nearby. Uh, but some of the mountains in Nepal stretch from 18,000 to 29,000 feet. For example, the Mount Everest base camp is around 17,000 feet, and it has about 53% of the oxygen content as uh, the same place, you know, land at like sea level. So there are some scientific studies that there is an increase of plasma and red cell iron turnover rates in higher elevations to compensate for hypoxia. So essentially your kidneys sense that there's an oxygen deficiency in your blood and respond by secreting a hormone called erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to accelerate the production of red blood cells, blood cells, and your count rises. So if you live in these environments, these changes are just kind of a normal part of how your body functions. If you actually travel to higher elevations, your body will start to compensate in about two hours time. And this is why many athletes train in those high altitude places. And whenever like NFL players go to Denver, they usually show up like a day beforehand so their body can acclimate. And uh, these changes can stay in your body for around 20 days. So sometimes athletes will go and do this altitude training so that whenever they go somewhere else, they they have more oxygen-rich blood for like the next 20 days so they can perform better. There's a lot of studies uh, where people think that's performance enhancing, essentially. Is it that significant enough to make a huge difference? I don't know, but that's what I found out. Yeah, they got got more red blood cells. Nice. Hmm. Uh, but but did they're a little guy though? Oh yeah yeah they're he's obviously yeah. <laughs> they're not six foot nine. Nick Hughes. <laughs> yeah, that mat- it matters very much. In fact, you know, being six foot nine is actually a disadvantage <laughs> when it comes to getting <laughs> shot at. You're a bigger target. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> I want the guy oh, who's less. Oh, he would oh, use a fancy word. He'd be like. Less target area. You cannot acquire in your sight picture. Are you going to shoot something that has a higher overall flesh volume? I don't think so. All right. Anyway, speaking of Nick Hughes, let's go to the experts. God, <laughs> Nick, Nicky boy. Yeah, big big dick Nick. Prick Hughes. Ooh, got him. So we got Rostra Rye. He is listed as a retired 20-year Gurkha soldier. My research, I found he has a pretty active Instagram. Appears to be a fitness and combat instructor. I found a hype video of him on what I believe is his son's YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, he's kind of just what he says he is. Next, we have Lieutenant John Conlin, who upon the first frame of him being on screen, I knew this motherfucker was British. (laughs) Like I, I saw him, I'm like, that is his British handler. Uh pretty <laughs> is Nigel Thornberry looking ass. Right. <laughs> I said he looks like he carries around bookcases with him everywhere he goes and he like looks at him with a magnifying glass. Right. So he's retired British Gurkha commander. He's also a Gurkha historian. Now, next thing, and he's an officer of the Gold Dragoons, which is some kind of high society polo club. Again, just a complete caricature. (laughs) Um, I did find someone. So this is where it gets a little bit interesting. Nothing really juicy. I got to pull up TikTok for this. He goes, 
Sorry, lad. I know you served well in the Gurkhas, but let's just say you're not quite the character we're looking for at our polo club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So I found someone asked a question about the Gurkhas and on, on Quora, I should say. And it's this guy had this very thoughtful answer. And he had his same name of John Conlon. And he had a TikTok in his name. This TikTok has over 100,000 followers. It is at your.internet.dad. And here's... Tell me this is him. I can't really tell. There's no real legal definition of a gentleman under American law. But we all seem to be able to recognize one when we meet them. Actually, under English common law, about 300 years ago, they resolved the issue. Back this is in those music. Days, only the aristocracy was it taxed. definitely. It looks like him and doesn't look like him at the same time. Yeah, I know. Man, I'll send this to you so you can be the judge, but. Yeah. Um, Maybe it's his brother. It could be. With the same. With the same name. Here, I'll put it on the... It looks like they put the wrong hair on him. His hair, like, doesn't look like it belongs on his head. (laughs) Right. But (laughs) Yeah. But he has the same name, knows a lot about the Gurkhas, according to Quora, and uh, I don't know, I think this could be him. But I want to hear what Matt has to say. I think that is him. It looks like him. Yeah, and he's talking about being a gentleman. Oh, yes. One does not properly define a gentleman. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he's got 100k followers. I don't know if he bought those or what, but um, to be a gentleman, you have to invade a country and make them your warriors, right? But yeah, that's uh, Mr. Internet Dad. Next, we have arguably the standout star of the episode, Corporal Nick Hughes. He's a retired recon diver and commando, an active Shamar Moore stunt double, dude. As soon as he showed up on screen, the, my first note was, you can immediately tell this guy is the heel. <laughs> yeah. He is going to be like, cocky. Ju- he's going to be annoying. <laughs> right. Just just by how he looks. He's like big, bald. He's got a goatee. Then they're like, he's Australian. I was like, oh, come on. What's nuts come about on. him, he shows up and you look at him and you're like, he's the most vocal member of that team but somehow he's like not the douchiest member of that team <laughs> no no he's and i actually noted he actually turns out not to be the most annoying one uh that that goes to mr jeff waro phd <laughs> sorry sorry if you're watching this jeff <laughs> i'm sure he is yeah, come on the pod and defend yourself bitch yeah, don't don't quit your day job jeff <laughs> fucking bitch <laughs> Um, all right so let's go style it up a few notches you fucking piece of (laughs) kill yourself no okay (laughs) nick nick hughes so i I guess maybe i missed something is he did he say he was part of the french foreign legion or no yeah he does so he's australian how did that work legitimately i don't i didn't quite understand it so because the the French Foreign Legion recruits from French everywhere. Mm-hmm. So he's a foreigner. So he signed up for it. Do you think he was a criminal? That's what I was gonna. I was hoping you'd find something about that because he like specifically says like everyone in the French Foreign Legion just your criminals and scumbags and they're like. Then he's like, I was in the French Foreign Legion. So I was like, do the math. <laughs> yeah, in my completely like made up head canon, like this guy was like you know, like a crime boss or something beforehand yeah here's the thing though when you join the french foreign legion you can you can change your identity Hmm. you can pick a new name and be whoever the hell you want so nick hughes is a fake name too it's not very australian either why didn't he go with nick huge (laughs) because he's big i'm just saying he could have had a criminal record but under a different name like and then when he joined the Legion, picked a new name, all that shit got washed away. I don't know. I, I'm not saying that's what happened. Yes but or no? Do you think he's a criminal? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'll say yes. He, Yo, <laughs> pussy. No. He seems, Yo, Nick, he come seems on. He seems like a guy that just 
joined maybe for the adventure of it or money or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. The lifestyle. Right. But he doesn't really type. talk about uh, French Foreign Legion stuff or him having to make some difficult choice. I get the impression he's more of like a mercenary guy. Um, so yeah. Nick Hughes, I found his combat instruction DVDs with some amazing box art, which Lucas can see. One hundred and ninety nine ninety five <laughs> for a six DVD package set of how to fight. Um, Excuse me. Here, I'll I'll throw this in the um, two hundred dollars for six DVDs. I mean, what the yeah, price? Oh on yeah, your, um, was that the actual DVDs? Amazon price? Because that's like on the cover of the DVD. It's like only one ninety nine. It was not available. 99. So oh, uh, we, I guess darn. you can assume it's right on the fucking. While thing. you're reading the rest, I'm going to try to find a copy online. What was it we, called? We brought it up earlier. I bought like a full box set of like all eight seasons of Game of Thrones on Blu ray, and that was not that much money. That <laughs> was less than $200. Yeah. That is insane. Uh... Oh shit! I'll add to my wish list. See if, if anyone out there wants to buy me. Are you sure it's not Nick in Hughes Australian Legionnaire. dollars? <laughs> uh, there's a, a dollar sign here. I'm sending kangaroo, it right out of the group. Kangaroo group bucks. Check it out. Let me know what you think. A killer box art as well. I'd hang that up in my room. That poster. <laughs> oh hell yeah! Look at that. Can you imagine your uh, your laying there at night and you wake up and this man is just staring at you this, how can you how dude, can you not like roll out of bed ready for the work day this would be a sick Eight. poster unironically yeah five out of five stars uh seven reviews there's so. there's a french foreign legion combatives fade six unarmed like dvd listing on ebay and the picture is just like a gi joe with all the clothes taken off <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> I should read these reviews. I didn't think to do that. Okay. We'll get back on the rolls in a sec. I need to I need to check this out. Nick Hughes. Hopefully there's not like an actor or author named Nick Hughes. Nick Hughes. Oh, what the fuck? Where'd it go? I can't find it again. I think it like I linked to it or something. I got it right here. Oh, look at the reviews. See what they say. If there's any reviews. There were seven. Some of my favorite training DVDs. Outstanding series. It's got like all five stars. FFL combative series. Top class hey, material. Do you think these people I know all pay we're, $200? I know we're off of Nick Hughes. Oh, we're still on. But it is, it is, well, I know we're off. We're on Nick Hughes right now. The previous guy we were talking about, John Conlon. It's funny that we mentioned like how British he is because I went back and double checked uh, Flash Fox Foles notes, and he wrote on there that uh, in his bio it says he enjoys fox hunting, <laughs> yeah. which is just a very stereotypically <laughs> British. Thing. Like, oh, me and me and the hounds are going out today. Blue, I'm, hello, a, I'm blue, an officer hello. in the Gold Dragoons. <laughs> The gold, me and the gold dragoon. <laughs> He's like a caricature. Come now. Quad save the queen. <laughs> we'll go fox hunting. We'll be back in time for tea. Okay. Oh, yes. Indubitably. Uh, can you tell us about Jeff Wario? <laughs> Craig. Yeah, I am almost done with uh, Nick Hughes, though. Um, so, D Combat DVD. His clients include members of the Saudi royal family, rock stars, actors, and businessmen. Mm. He has a book titled How to Be Your Own Bodyguard, Self-Defense for Men and Women from a Lifetime of Protecting Clients in Hostile Environments. 1999 on Amazon. Check it out. All right, let's get into Jeff... Warward, the vowel hater himself. So he's PhD, a French Foreign Legion historian. Research, I personally found absolutely nothing. However, notes from Flash Foxful says legit professor of military history at UNT. I will take his word for it. Even has his own Wikipedia page, seemingly still works there, and has a specialty in European military history. 
hosted a history channel show called hardcover history where he discusses with authors about history books it definitely exists but i can't find it streaming in the u.s i don't know i this guy has a pretty unique name and i found jack shit so yeah i'll go figure that's him. Why do you guys hate him so much? He didn't really like, make that big of an impression to me. He like doesn't do any of the tests and he tries to trash talk Rostra at some point and it just like flops hard and everyone just like, eh. He has like yeah, very he's... little camera time, but he just rubs you the wrong way that like 30 seconds he's on camera. <laughs> yeah, he's always doing the little minion thing. I don't know. Like he's, he's there and he's like, oh. <laughs> They're trying to give him the edge because he's got more red blood cells than you, big guy. Oh, yeah, he does. I compared that to the situation <laughs> at the Trump roast where he was just like, hey, oh, yeah. hey, what are you going to do? <laughs> right. It, the, the joke just lands so flat. He, but... he's, like, he's like the little leprechaun co-host. <laughs> Even Dorian's like, hey, brother, <laughs> stick to your lane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dorian puts him in his place. <laughs> right. Listen. When the good doctor has to put you down, all right. The like king of corny jokes. <laughs> yeah, that's like, they, they got more red blood cells, right, fellas? That's why. Yeah. Yeah. Say, say what you will about Nick, but at least the man puts on a good show in the test. Yeah, he does the test so, so. instead of he does just... pretty good too. <laughs> right. So that's all I got. Uh, I guess it's time for Matt's movie corner. Lucas, did you already get Hell your yeah. medical corner out of the way? Yeah, it was pretty much just the red Hell blood cells. Yeah. I didn't feel like looking in the French Foreign Legion because it was. I figured it would just be like two syphilis. Generics. Yeah, they have syphilis, all of them. High syphilis <laughs> it's a requirement, <laughs> right? Matt, give us give us your movies. Yeah, so for Matt's movie corner, uh, I watched one movie for each warrior. And like I said, a variety of free documentaries and training videos. Uh, For the French Foreign Legion, there is actually a surprisingly high number of movies about the French Foreign Legion. You know, it's just that natural male obsession with, uh, you know, being a cool, like basically hanging out with your bros, right? You know, like, let's go to a village somewhere and just take it down. Um, (laughs) And so... I chose the 1998 Peter McDonald film, simply titled Legionnaire, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, Van Damme plays a boxer who's blackmailed by a gangster to throw a fight. After he refuses to do it, the only way he can escape is to join the French Foreign Legion. Uh, The movie is free on Amazon Prime and Tubi, and it's only an hour and 30 minutes long. I'll give you guys the honest review. Uh, it's it's very slow. Um, I I found myself getting a little bored by it. Uh, but if you fast forward to like some of the battle scenes, uh, especially the fight at the end where they're defending a fortress, it's not the battle from the from the episode. But the um, act of defense. Most we would have seen footage from it. In yeah. The episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The act the action in it though is uh, pretty good. Um, and then for the Gurkhas, I took this recommendation from FFF, and uh, he recommended this movie called Fury Fight. I think it's Fury Fight. Yeah. Uh, which is, he billed as a so bad it's good movie, and it's made by and starring a former Gurkha named Sonny B, who has like a martial arts academy in California, and of course it's in the movie. Uh, it's very, it's very much like uh, if you watch Best of the Worst on Red Letter Media, you'll know about uh, Len Kavazinski, uh, and you know he's a guy who is just a martial arts guy who makes these movies where he's the action hero and he, you know he just he beats people up and he gets the girl in the end. And this movie, uh, it's also free on Amazon Prime. And it's only like an hour and 20 minutes long. And my review is that it's awful. (laughs) Um, It's so funny because I can't even call it a B movie. Because I literally, the day before recording this, watched a B horror movie. Uh, Some of uh, my wife's friends were in this, uh, this horror movie. And it's a B movie. And it was actually, like, you could tell it was a B-movie, but it was pretty decent. 
this movie is awful. This is like it's like incoherently bad. Um, yeah, it's none of it's good. You only watch it to uh, kind of laugh at it, and some of it's pretty funny. I did watch the whole thing. Unfortunately, I wrote you need the endurance of a Gurkha to make it through the entire thing. <laughs> so <laughs> those were those were my two movies. You got Fury Fight. Starring Sonny B and Legionnaire, starring Jean Claude Van Damme. So those are those are my recommendations. If you want to, uh, well, recommendations uh, as companion pieces for this episode. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, why don't we get into the actual episode, boys? Uh, I want to say uh, oh. Triple F. Did you watch that movie when you sent it over as a recommendation? <laughs> Let us know in the comments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let's, notwithstanding, I don't think he's going to answer in time. Uh, Triple F, I think Xander Cage. Yeah. I don't think he's going to answer in time for us to put the video up. Oh, I'm saying like in the comments. No, once it's, yeah. 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 I, don't think he, I don't think he heard us. Okay. Um, so, long range. We have the, I mean, I just call it long range. Like, it's the best thing to call it. The Browning Automatic Rifle. Stats are an effective range of 600 yards, which I feel like is pretty goddamn far. Because it's not talking about max range, because they always flip around. This is effective range. I feel like that's long. Mm. Six football fields for an LMG for an effective range, but, you know. Do you know it's also known as the bar? (laughs) I will get to that, actually. (laughs) So... uh, (laughs) Ford? I will not be referring to it as the bar. It's the B-A-R. <laughs> the bar. That's what it's called. <laughs> so it's 450 to 650 rounds per minute, 20 round mag capacity, weight 19 pounds. And I wrote that it's not the Browning that I initially think of. And then I just realized after writing that, that Dan and I had the same conversation at World at War about how the bar is a Browning. Because I accidentally called the B-A-R in World at War a Browning. And Dan was like, well, you're not really wrong. And I was like, well, what does bar stand for? And then Dan was like, and then I was like, yeah, oh. John, John Browning. Right. Yeah. Friend of the show. So, friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is the, for all you gun nuts, just, you know, this is the BAR from World of War. Just to make sure it's clear. Okay. Uh, 450 to 650 rounds per minute, 20 round mag capacity, weight 19 pounds. I think I said that already, but whatever. Um, and any information on the bar? It's really stupid. Yeah, so like, I, it doesn't even have a magazine on top of it. It's dumb. Right, right yeah. Who, why would you load it from the bottom? Uh, the <laughs> I also noted, because they didn't include the cartridges on any uh, on either of these rifles, they don't put it in the stats for the bolt actions either, but they, like, make mention of the rounds. Um, the BAR fires the 30 odd six Springfield, which is sort of like the standard cartridge of all the U S world war two guns. Uh, it's like you have the 30 caliber and then you have the 30 odd six and, um, you know, like the M one Garand and the Springfield fire the 30 odd six. So this is chambered in a big chunky round. Yeah. Your uncle goes and shoots deer with it. What's that? Your, it's the round your uncle shoots deer with. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Um, so the bar was invented. The bar. The BAR was invented. <laughs> God damn it, Craig. Was invented in 1918, and it saw heavy use with American forces during World War II and Vietnam. Uh, while the British and French did receive American weapons, it, it's a bit of a stretch to think that the foreign legion would have this weapon especially with the battle cited in the episode i know they give the time frame of 40 to 45 but i always kind of think if you're picking a specific moment in history like you're referring directly to that and uh, you know these french soldiers in north africa definitely would not have had like bars it's not impossible but it's not very likely um it is it's so cool actually the on the standard. Show. 
Yeah, what? In terms of weapon, it's cool to have it on the show. It's recognizable. It's good to have. Yeah, a so I will. I, I have that noted here. Uh, the standard LMG for the French Army was would have been either the Bren guns that were supplied by the British, or the FM twenty four twenty nine, which if you Google <laughs> that gun, you will see it looks eerily similar <laughs> to the Bren. It appears to be just a clone of the Bren. So I imagine the BAR was likely picked to give a different gun, you know, cause you can't have the Bren versus the Bren. So, and you know, we're, we're all the better for it. Cause it is, it's my favorite gun on the episode. I think it's cool. Um, and yeah, it makes for a good test. So swag. And like, if you were using it, you'd probably get tired, but Nick doesn't. Right. Yes. But yep. if you were like Rasta, you'd you'd be little. <laughs> right. Rostro, whatever his name is. Just want to just want to establish that. Um, so let's go to the tests before I get to the Bren, because that's how the order they do this in. So there are dummies in a firing range rigged with Tenorite. Once the Tenorite is triggered, the shooter can move on to the next station. I believe the Tenorite is placed to be like a you know instant kill zone. And he gets three kills in 58 seconds, and Nick does. Then we go on to the Bren, who mimics the same test. So the Bren stats are an effective range of 600 yards, again, 500 rounds per minute, a 30-round mag, 30 mag cap, and it's 23 pounds. Lucas, tell us about the Bren. Yeah, so this was the light machine gun made by Britain in the uh, 1930s, and it was used up until 2008. Uh, it didn't see like a lot of use, but it was technically used up till 2008. Uh, it was based off the Czechoslovak ZGB 33 light machine gun. Uh, Triple F had some notes though, on this too, and then I kind of just blended them with my notes, and uh, we found like the same thing. But yeah, I wanted to shout them out on this one. Uh, it's pretty much known for being used in World War II. The Korean War is commonly fitted with a bipod, tripod, or being vehicle mounted. There are five main variants, and it was mostly just different rounds that it was chambered in. What was the difference? Um, you, th this one, I think they're claiming, or on the show, I assume it's the 303 British, but some were fitted yes. with 762 NATO in uh, the 1950s. Yeah, because yeah. it would have to be the 303. Well, this would. This would definitely be the 303 because it's World War II era. Yeah. So. Um, they're also available with 100-round attachable pan magazines. So where does the name Bren come from? It comes from a place called B-R-N-O, Brno, I guess. Uh, this was a Czechoslovak city where the design originally came from. The guns were genuinely well-liked, but... at um, they cost like 40 pounds each, you know, British money. They're made up money. So they were considered like a high cost weapon, which is why they were eventually replaced with the FN MAG in the 1970s. To no one's disbelief, the Bren was known to be extremely reliable and were even designed with sliding <laughs> dust covers to keep dirt and debris out of the mechanisms. Uh, it was considered extremely accurate due to its heavy barrel and soldiers reportedly preferred guns that had worn in barrels because it was considered to be too accurate sometimes which i found kind of interesting with what originally or um what eventually replaced this is just uh that high cost of production and the slower rate of fire essentially the military switched over to the mentality of instead of having like accurately placed shots we would rather just put lead down range so we want something that fires faster a little bit less accurate so that's what's led to it's uh getting replaced if these problems that uh, some certain people say on the show actually existed, it probably wouldn't have such a long life of service. Uh, I'm going to assume like every other episode, the, the jam is fake. Oh, yeah. There is a lack of targets. Um, Why are they doing light machine guns with like three targets? Why don't they have like a... Oh. Why don't they line up like 10 targets? Yeah, it was very weird, and they made them... It's like the end of the season, so they're, like, out of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, they only do three targets, and they make it so they have to do an artificial, like, mag change in the middle. Like, usually they give them enough targets that uh, you would get the magazine change. But with these, 
they're just ba- they're obviously both of them are told to just expend ammo on the brick wall for the second target because <laughs> yeah. they do. There's no other and, point to it besides that. Yeah, I don't know if a guy's behind the there. Out. What's that? I don't know if a guy's behind that wall. <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if a child's hiding behind me. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the Bren, the jam, the jam, it's jammed, guns jammed. Uh, it's clearly not. They say it's a misfire, and um, all he does is change the magazine. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and so they, they clearly put like two rounds in a magazine and then just made him change it and pretended it was some kind of reliability issue also misfired i mean that would equally if that i mean it's completely fake but that could be you know the firing pin not striking the primer hard enough but that could equally be from bad ammunition which wouldn't be the gun's fault theoretically right and they he doesn't cycle around through it or anything which is how they fake it sometimes uh he just immediately knows to take the mag out and put a new one in. And Oh, I'm you mean the like mag that. that when he's firing goes... <laughs> <laughs> it's like that bridge. You ever see it like in the wind where it goes like this? Yeah. It's like that's the gun when it fires. Uh, I'll get to that, but they do the slow motion footage and they're like... Mm, they're jingling around. Every gun will like look like that in slow motion. It's bullshit. I, I, di- I disagree, Lucas. I actually think it's a really good point. Uh, the BAR doesn't shake like that because its sights are a little different. Yeah, can it shake like um, this? <laughs> and it's a better, it's a better made piece. The hips of don't lie on which that. Which is the point grind. that they're getting across. Yeah, I mean, something uh, that they could have argued a little bit better though is like the offset sights are obviously not the most ideal. Mm-hmm. Right. It the gun. All right, we can get into that when we get into the edge, but. I will say one funny part. I don't know if you guys caught this, but there's like a part between the tests where the the experts have a meaningless debate about the sling. <laughs> did you guys see? Did you guys remember that? Like, no. Well, uh, why don't we? Um, let, would we talk we're about talking the about like firing from the hip versus firing from the shoulder with the BAR? But then when they do the test, both of them just fire from a bipod. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, what are, what are we even talking about? Neither of you are doing... You could put a sling like, on either weapon and just carry it around right. like that. Like, it's not like it's an and exclusive perk of that weapon. There is exercises for shooting the BAR from the hip. Yeah, and like, like that thing's it, what? what they say, like 19 or 20 pounds? I'm probably going to fire that thing from the hip if it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, so... I don't know. I will, before you go forward, Craig, I have to mention Nick pulling off that uh, very aesthetic where he almost knocks over the barrel when he catches it with the bipod. Strong work. Yeah. (laughs) Well, so for the test for the Bren, Rostra repeats the same test. The Bren immediately jams, so you already know it's over. Despite the jam, (laughs) Rostra gets three kills in 53 seconds, so less time. Probably because he's so small. He was booking it like he, he had was. something to prove. Like, watch him run with that gun. He is like... <laughs> I know. He was fucking moving. You could see the oxygenated blood right. coursing <laughs> through his veins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, so let's get to the edge. In an analysis that I've never seen done in another Deadliest Warrior episode, Max says that because the sight and the mag jiggle from the recoil as Rastra shoots, it loses the edge. It also says that the bar is more versatile. I'll leave it to the gun guys to fight it out from there. What do you guys think? I don't think it's a good enough reason for an edge. That's about it. Especially considering how much faster he was even with the jam. Yeah, I mean, there's reasons why the bar can be better uh, yeah, to well, me. Well, but... I, I would slow your roll there, sir, because these these jams and the, the time limits on these tests are not reliable at all. Um, just like the bar. Got him. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, there's definitely some fuckery during the test, but the edge, the edge is correct here, and I agree with the point they're trying to make. 
Uh, I'm sorry. I know that you read on Wikipedia that it says the brand is very reliable and people love it. It's also a piece of shit. No, um, I interviewed. This reminds I interviewed This soldiers. reminds me very much <laughs> of the season one Sten versus Thompson uh, comparison, where you have a British weapon that is being mass produced and they are just getting it out as quick as they possibly can, and that's why you have. Shit is jiggling on the gun. You have a fucking dumbass mag, mag in the, with the Sten. It's loaded in on the side with the brand. It's coming in at the top. It's not ergonomic. Gravity assisted. It's just, it's something that is mass produced. <laughs> the BAR, on the other hand, now that is American manufacturing power, baby. It's a better made gun. It's more expensive. And I think the results speak for themselves. It doesn't jiggle in the slow mo. So listen, I think they got it right. B A R, edge baby, and it's got a bigger round too, it's more stopping power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, outside of the, the girl. I was bias. waiting. I was waiting, Lucas, for the. <laughs> I mean, I can't even come up with a valid like counter argument, honestly. But I'll come back around, uh, you know, and say that the results we get at the end, where it's like sixty-five to thirty-five, I think is ridiculous. Both are still like, going to be putting I, lead downfield. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, how <laughs> yeah. did it get? Like, you say, look at the. When it comes to, I didn't disclose this. I was 100 percent rooting yeah. for the Gurkha watching us. So we got mm. the Bren boys over here at the table. I thought this test right here was going to be like the death sentence. Yeah, with I the was jam, like, oh, you lost like the was, machine gun. You know, this is going to get most of the kills. And the uh, I'll tell you what, lads. Um, when I was watching this, knowing the outcome, I think the writing's on the wall as soon as they introduce Nick, because <laughs> you can tell that he's the bad guy of the episode, and. I was like, this right here is the is the warning signs. The writing's on the wall. Like, But yes, you are right. When that jam happens, it's like, okay, here's the edge that they're going to get. Just yeah, ahead. I thought it was. I do. Mac is on his shit in this, though. Everyone else comes in with like, he is. you know, I think this. And Mac's like, shut up. No, it's yeah. this. <laughs> and if there's one complaint I do have about this episode is because... I'm going to say the same thing for the rifle and the knife test. The narratives that they're pushing, I don't think the tests do a great job of supporting them at all. Like, especially with this one, too. Like, the BAR gets 65% of the kills, whatever that means, versus the Bren's 35, which is pretty, like, pretty big by Season 3 standards. When you watch this test, you see the Bren finish with a better time. And it still takes out all the targets, so it's like I don't know. Like I, I agree with the point that they're trying to make that the bar the the bar damn you guys. <laughs> that the bar is like a better gun, better made, but um you know, you don't really see that in the test <laughs> like they have to pull out slow motion and mac has to be like firing from the hip i can lean in with it i can lean <laughs> back with it i can hold it sideways like a gangster you know <laughs> i do like that the logic of you can lean into this weapon you can do that with any weapon <laughs> right well on that yeah, so. on that note let's go on to medium range we have the MAS-36, I'm sorry, Matt, the MAS-36 uh, stats. No, this one's the MOS. Okay, sorry, my bad. Idi idiot. <laughs> the, the MOS Amata. Stats, 375 yards, 40-inch length, 8.5 pounds, 5-round mag capacity. I'll introduce the Enfield as well. Oh, wait, no. Now let's let's go over the mass, then we'll go over the Enfield. Um, mass thirty six. More like ass thirty six. Yeah, tell us about the 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 butt thirty six. 
Every time I hear Moss 36, all I can think of is like the Taco Bell commercial, Live Moss. So, uh, shout out to Taco Bell, get the our tattoo, new sponsor. Live Moss, and you get the picture of that tattooed on your arm. Just a, a, a French foreign soldier, or a French foreign legion soldier who's just had a, a Chalupa Grande, and he's got to go on a hike, and he's like, oh. Sir, <laughs> I'm thinking the end of like an action movie. There's two people fighting. The one guy pulls out his like rifle, shoots the guy in the head, and he goes, "Live, Moss," and then the credits roll. The He's commercial. like, "Die, Moss." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Craig, I did. I don't want you to think it went unappreciated. I liked the little dong <laughs> you gave there. That was perfect. Yeah, every commercial got um, all that. So the Moss 36 is interesting rifle. Um, it's a rifle that's already obsolete by the time it's getting put into service. Uh, the French initially, so after World War I, the French initially intended to replace the Labelle. And um, there's, there was another bolt action that they used around that time. But they're intending to replace those with, the semi, with a semi-automatic rifle. But the rollout was so slow... That they ended up having to uh, create the Moss 36, and it was only intended to be a stepping stone, like you know, a backup quarterback before you draft your new rookie. But uh, the Germans didn't get the memo, and the war kicked off, so it it had to see action. For gun nerds, if you want to know more about the Moss 36, I would highly recommend checking out the Forgotten Weapons video on it so forgotten weapons is a youtube channel uh the episode on the moss 36 is really interesting so it's sort of this it's a really well-made rifle but like it's so weird that they make this gun in 1936 and put it into service it's like and it only holds five rounds it's like what what the fuck (laughs) yeah um so yeah, okay. that's all. That's all I got on it. Okay. Now moving on, Matt, we have the E N F I E L D number four rifle. <laughs> so stats are a 550 yard effective range, length 44.5 inches, 8.75 pounds, 10 round mag capacity. Lucas, what can you tell us about this gun? Uh, is this the second time we've had the Enfield on here, or at least a variant of the? Yeah, the we Enfield? got we got the SML Lee in the Lawrence yeah. of Arabia episode. That is right. This is one of the many variants of the Lee Enfield rifles, main firearm in the British Empire during the first half of the 20th century. Ten round box magazine was loaded, um, 303 British caliber again. It's fed with the five round stripper clips as seen on the show. Part of the gun names come from the uh, the part of the name of the gun comes from the designer of the uh, bolt system, who was James Paris Lee. Other part was where it was created, the Royal Small Arms Factory in Enfield. Number four variant was a batch. Uh, there was like 2,500 number four rifles that were made for trials originally, and this model was officially adopted in 1941. Perfect timing for a world war. Number two. This number four model was stronger and easier to mass produce, although it was slightly heavier, and uh, it paired with the number four bayonet. Cost around seven dollars. Sorry, dollars. <laughs> Britain, seven point seven right. five pounds to produce. Seven quid. <laughs> seven quid. Seven quid and six pence. Oh, what are Whatever you that silly means. nanny? <laughs> Part of that is just out of control. It's out, out of the <laughs> you board. Remember that? Do you guys remember that meme when Harry Styles got mugged? And someone someone posted a tweet, and it was like, "Oi, oi, Harry, give me all your fucking quid, <laughs> you muppet, <laughs> you muppet, <laughs> you muppet." <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> There's a million Lee Enfields. Everyone knows the Enfield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's get on to the test. So we got the good old. Shooting a ballistic gel through a crony. Intended purpose. Yes. The crony. Uh, mass gets a 2,647 feet per second. The end field gets 2,417 feet per second. Now, the mass is given not the formal edge, but they say it performs better in this test. 
I am legitimately confused because I thought we learned last episode that less velocity was better. Well, that was last episode. Things change. Yeah, Craig, that was the last episode. <laughs> the laws I of physics change am... between episodes. <laughs> <laughs> it also is interesting, Craig, because uh, the 303 is slightly bigger than the cartridge the Moss is firing. So the Enfield's firing the 303 British. And the Moss is firing the 7.5 five by 5.4 five French round. Uh, if you pay attention in the episode two, Nick kind of like fucks it up when he's introducing the cartridge. He's like, it fires the uh, 7.45 by 5.445 four, five <laughs> round. It's got a five round magazine. And the round they used was the 7.5454, five four, five four, which is this one here. Very fast, very accurate. <laughs> he like he's listing off a whole bunch of shit. Uh, the sixty nine by sixty nine like, round, sir. Sir, that's not a bullet size. That is the amount of light years that the Spartan shield sends you into space with, right? Uh, when you get hit, uh, so uh, so it's seven five by five four. Now the Enfield's three oh three round translates to seven point seven by five six. So it's actually slightly bigger, but I guess with this, it's a greater muzzle velocity, so a larger temporary cavity. I honestly am a little... With the last one, Craig, it was sort of a... What guns were it, was it? It was the SMLE in the in the crag. Well, whatever. Look. I don't fucking know. I think they're just trying to set up that one has got the bit, the bigger bullet, but the other one's got, you know, other advantages. So I mean, th- this is where, like, even, if even I'm picking up on this, because last episode they're like, it's like a laser, but there's no tumbling effect <laughs> versus the lower velocity. You actually get much more stopping power and carnage. Mm-hmm. They get a hard-on for temporal cavity, cavities. It's yeah. Like, towards the end of the show here first this it's like it goes right through the gel torso creating a bigger temporary well, listen, cavity the moss the moss needs all the help it can get because they do fuck the moss in the test by not giving the guy a i don't remember clip. that part <laughs> what's that i don't remember that part <laughs> <laughs> they Was don't the give him cut? a fucking stripper clip yeah and so the time is like way more <laughs> right uh well let's go on to the second test so we have a long range moving target test that you know both participants do which just a minor note i guess it is nice that they have a head to head test it makes it maybe a little bit less varied in the action but i think people would ultimately prefer this rather than to tests have nothing to yes. do with each other well don't worry these tests agree. will actually be used and mac just won't come up with something on the spot again okay to determine the edge don't <laughs> okay. worry that's good <laughs> um so in this test they have moving in static targets the enfield gets a time of two minutes seven seconds with 13 hits an 80 percent hit ratio on the static and a 50 percent rate hit ratio on the moving targets um and then the moss gets a time of 254 seconds 14 hits 60 percent hit ratio on the stack targets 80 percent on moving targets um we get as we kind of alluded to earlier a very bad vibes moment after the gurga test where the british guy says gentlemen when you look at rye you're actually looking at 200 years of military tradition his father fought in burma he has wanted to be a soldier since he was five years old they want to obey they want to be disciplined by the british yes he Quote, they want to obey, they want to be disciplined. Yeah. Very weird. I know he didn't mean, I don't think he meant it. But, but the, I feel like most like, pe- British people, that is, they don't mean ill, yeah. but they just assume that these are lower life forms <laughs> and they're like animals that they have to like study. <laughs> then he like, zips the, the zipper shut over his mouth. On right. His mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think we've said all that needs to be said there. Yeah. Um, so during the test, I will just point out what I mentioned before that, uh, they do some reloading in the middle of the test and the Lee Enfield uses two five round, 
uh, stripper clips to reload its 10 round magazine. Uh, I would just like to say when they did the SMLE test, uh, if you remember, they did a little goof where they were like, they said he uses a 10 round stripper clip, which was really funny. Um, but in this, they, they're willing to admit that they use two five round ones. Um, and then they make the Moss load single fire and they give the implication that like, it doesn't have a stripper clip, but it did. There are, my theory is that this rifle is way more rare than the Enfield. You know, the Enfield, there was like a billion of them made. So you can find them today and you can find accessories. The Moss 36, far fewer produced. And I be willing to bet they just could not find stripper clips for the damn thing. Probably so not. That was my assumption. They just decided also. to make do. Uh, what I, that's fine, but what I don't like is that they, you know, if you were actually doing testing for this, you would account for that. You would be like, okay, well, maybe the Enfield guy gets one stripper clip and then he has to load the last five, right? He's still going to get a better time because he has to reload less often. But, or you would just give the, uh, give a handicap to the Moss a little bit on its time. But they don't do that. Um, I think you have... This is very similar to the Lawrence versus Teddy episode where you do have a bigger guy with the smaller rifle, and I think he performs a lot better with it. Um, Especially with these old bolt-action guns, it helps to be a bigger dude. Uh, And then you have the smaller guy with the bigger rifle, and so when, when you do these accuracy tests where they're shooting at the targets i think um nick outperforms uh raw but you know he ends up getting less of a time because of the you know than not having a stripper clip so (laughs) this test also has like the wild editing where in between every shot they like have to get comments on it. Like, oh, he missed that one. Oh, good hit. Oh, it's like, oh, he missed. Oh, good hit. Yeah, it looks like he missed. There you go. That is a hit. Oh, dead center. Nice. Oh, nice. Nice. Right? Oh, he missed it. I missed that too. Missed it. Nice. That was a hit. That's clean. There you go. Bring it home. Bring it home. I missed it. There you go. Nice shot. Excellent. And again. Nice again, done. Man. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, it is missed? some chaotic editing. Yeah. <laughs> also, one thing I point out when we were watching it, and I will put in the uh, clip, obviously, to make it easier. I'm pretty sure the gun sound is fake. Oh, definitely. Because it's the exact mm-hmm. noise over and over again. Yeah. Um. So you be the judge. Yeah, the I th- French one I think goes, their audio oh, just gets fucked oh. out there. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah but it's it, <laughs> yeah so that test uh, whatever uh, I think Nick was a little too big for this test yeah and the Gurkha <laughs> just, just little enough he was booking he's it just, he's a little dude he's a little yeah. guy yeah. he's like because he keeps getting trash talked um, this is like the third time he's got trash talked he is booking it like he has something to prove on these tests <laughs> right <laughs> So Edge goes to the Gurks. Anybody got anything to say? I mean, the reasoning they give is sort of. I mean, the the Enfield's bolt. It's like has a, a bolt that's like known for being really smooth and easy to operate, and uh, you could probably fire both guns without moving your head if you knew how to operate them both. But uh, I mean, yeah, Mac just kind of like pulls this one out of his ass because they need someone. To make a decision yeah i would um i think jeff brings up the reload like the overall times and he's like you know the moss really gets killed by the reload which is an invalid opinion so i'm throwing it out um dorian tries to give the edge to the moss because uh 
Nick does better on the moving targets. You know, while that makes for a better test, I think something like that is much more up to the operator rather than the rifle. Um, And so Mac, I think, delivers the only really salient points that any of them give where he's like, you know, you have a 10-round magazine versus a 5-round magazine, and you have the bolt, because the Enfield is famous for that, as you mentioned, Lucas. We mentioned the Mad Minute in the SMLE episode, and you're able to do that because the bolt on the gun doesn't come back so far to make you lift your head up off it. So you can keep your cheek weld firmly in place and your eyes down the sights, and cycle a new round, which creates a greater rate of fire. And you know what? The Moss, even if it's got better stopping power, um, 303 is plenty big enough. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to it's gonna put a man down. So I would definitely agree with the edge just based on, I mean, the Enfield's a legend. Um, and proven rifle... Greater magazine capacity, greater rate of fire. I, I would give it the edge. Uh, and I stick to my point that I, I, I made about the BAR versus the Bren, where uh, I don't think the test does a very good job of conveying like what they want it to convey on the show. I think Nick walks away looking better, in my opinion, in that, like, Hey, his gun's got greater stopping power. His gun, he did better on the moving targets than Raw did. So it's like, I walked away from that looking like, if you're just looking at this test, like, yeah, the reload sucks, but like, you have five rounds. It's only five guys on the enemy team. Like, if he's able to hit, uh, what, like, four out of five of them? That's more than enough. So, um, again, I don't think the test does a very good job of conveying what they want to. And as Lucas mentioned, Mac just sort of has to swoop in <laughs> and pull it out his pull it out his keister, you know, just like, okay, idiots. <laughs> Since none of you can do what you need to do, let me tell you what's getting the edge here. <laughs> even that are these like hits even real in these tests anymore because oh. like nick gets like 50 percent on the static targets and 80 percent on the moving targets and you're just like it's a little fishy sounding like <laughs> right and is that shit even real yeah you know um is it real or the times real probably not i mean this shit's all <laughs> Right. This shit's all fake, dog. Yeah. You know. Does Abella Danger have that many stepbrothers? You know, I don't the think The answer's so. probably no. Right. I hope not, based on what I've seen. <laughs> if I have, I've seen some fucked up shit. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Am I? Uh, close range. So, first weapon, the Kukri. Stats, 15.5 inches fun long. Word to say. Kukri. I think of like Kukri. I think of like potpourri. So I don't know if they have to do with each other, but uh, fifteen point five inches long, ten point five inch blade, one pound, made of steel. Uh, give us some background on the kukri. Sure. Uh, according to the ever reliable Wikipedia, it's actually considered a short sword by some. That's probably because everyone there is so short, right? Uh, it's been in nice. service <laughs> it's been in service since the 17th century it is the national weapon of nepal uh it's a basic utility knife for the gurkhas and it's the characteristic weapon of the nepali army real quick did you, the u.s have a national weapon do you, i don't know a national the ar-15 yeah, probably <laughs> it's a national weapon no. i mean it is the ar is definitely the national weapon. <laughs> okay i was just curious uh continue i got a shirt that has an ar on it says usa that's proof enough for me (laughs) uh there are myths surrounding this blade that once unsheathed it must draw blood before being sheathed again it's a very traditional weapon that can be used in ceremonies but it also has its uh humble roots and it's used by farmers hunters and laborers 
Its origins can be traced back to the domestic sickle, and many cultures have a similar weapon to this. It was first introduced to the Western world during that 1815 conflict that we referenced before with uh, Britain kind of invade Nepal. All Gurkha troops are issued two kukris, a service number one, which is ceremonial, and a service number two, which is used in exercise and just kind of like a daily use. So Rostro points out that the blade has a notch at the bottom, which makes the blood drop off the blade instead of reaching your hand, which prevents the old slippery handle. It has a second meaning that represents the teats of a cow as a reminder that it should never be used to kill a cow as they are revered and worshipped in the region. The blade has also been adopted by other militaries such as the Indian Army. So it's a pretty cool blade and it is very, uh, very like ingrained into the Gurkhas pretty much. Cool. Well, nice. yeah, uh, the Kukri, when Dave Baker, weapons maker, uh, is forging it in his lab, I noticed it looks like a smaller version of the Copus. Yeah. Uh, it probably takes inspiration you know, from swords like that and yeah. just shrinks Alexander it down the a little Great bit. Alexander the Great Sword, the Copus, which we see in the Hannibal episode also, it looks like exactly the same thing just like smaller yeah <laughs> um uh so i thought that was kind of neat um i will add for the kukri that my dad has a kukri from when he was in the service he wasn't a gurkha i think he just bought it <laughs> Um, How did he find one for sale? I thought Dave Baker had to resurrect one for the first time. For right, like 50 I did years. notice that they said that you can go on like <laughs> they still like, like issue them. Yeah, you can go on like the internet and buy one. Yeah. Um, but my dad had one, and when I was like a teenager, you know, I was always fucking around with it, like taking it out in the woods and chopping, you know, plants and stuff with it, and. uh I, like I said, when I went to watch this episode, no idea who the Gurkhas are. It comes on, we get to the Kukri, and I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I recognize that thing. I'm always fucking around with it. Yeah, you heard um, it here first, folks. Matt hates nature. Just goes out and just <laughs> kills plants. <laughs> I was an only child, and I lived next to the woods, okay? It's, you had, some days you had to figure it out, okay? <laughs> The um, bad stat was like, don't worry, these won't hit back. Yeah. <laughs> well, real quick before we get to that, though, I realized that I fucked up. We almost overlooked yeah, there is Max like the, Chalk that, Talk. Yeah. So, let's, so, yeah, I think we should just finish the knives at this point and then do... Then hit up the, the tactics. The chalk talk. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll do that. I noticed it, too, but I figured let's just, you know, keep let's it roll with it. Okay. I'm cool with that. So for the Kukri, the test is like this enemy encampment situation where there's a slab of beef that you have to attack. An ally springs awake like a cartoon to test their reflexes. Um, yeah, and you have to like contend with that. So Rostra does some crazy shit with kicks and slashes. Velocity impact 59 miles per hour. There's really not like... Um, a test here so much. It's not like you have to like, they're not really time. This, this is what you can do. Um, Nick says he was unimpressed because Rastra quote, took his eyes off the enemy. Like what was he supposed to do? Like engage in a <laughs> knife fight, like a, with like two slabs of beef. Like, like ideally I'm watching you dude. Yeah. Like I would see both, both of these, like, you're like, come on. Like you're taking it a little too serious. <laughs> he also criticizes the kicks too. And then he does a fucking kick in his test. Right. <laughs> He's like, those kicks were so dumb, but I'm going to do one too. Yeah, with his dumb accent. Next, we have the Camelus. Stats Camelus. are 12 inches, 7 inch blade, 3.5 pounds, and made of steel. What do we know about the Camelus? So, the... Uh... <laughs> Hold on, I'm queuing up a, a new background. Okay. Uh, <laughs> a new background image for myself. Camillus Harris. <laughs> I was trying to get it before the turn, and now it's just awkward. Um, here we go. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you know, you know. So the, the camel loose is. <laughs> uh, so what they show on the episode, it's just a K bar, which is a uh, long serving utility slash combat knife in the American military, and I believe is the standard issue combat knife for the U.S. Marine Corps, Lucas. Yurt. Right? Yurt. The, the, the K-bar. Um, and Camelo- the reason it's called Camelous is just because uh, the Camelous Cutlery Company, uh, they made more K-bars during World War II than any other manufacturer. So, uh, we saw the K-Bar in the Israeli Commando episode. Uh, went up against... It was overshadowed by Rob Roy's uh, Recon 1 performance. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. let's go to the test. Not really too much to say. Nick goes kind of nuts, I'm not going to lie. His velocity impact was 81 miles per hour. Um Oh, we we got to touch on the the um, comment. This thing is the beginning of the Gurkha test, or before it. They're describing that test, and uh, he, Rostra says something like, "Oh, don't worry, these won't hit back or whatever." To <laughs> Nick, then everyone laughs kind of harder than they should, and Nick gets so pissed off, he's just like, "Doesn't hit back, Nick. Don't worry." <laughs> uh, thanks, kid. No, <laughs> I'm not worried. It's like, yeah, you seem like a he does, really he goes, fun. He like grunts and like growls and everything during his test. You can tell he's just like, I'm not the stupid one, right? And he kind of takes out his frustration, his anger on this poor dummy. So yeah, he he's definitely uh, overcompensating for the knife because, as we know in Deadliest Warrior, the bigger knife always wins. Uh, and I actually have a further comment to make about that. Um, for the record, I'm not going to disagree with the edge or anything like that. Um, but this test, like, Nick definitely makes much more of a show with the Camelus than uh, Ra does with the Kukri. Um, and I think there is two other instances in Season 3 where we have these modern warriors and for some reason we give them a fucking knife as one of their weapons pistol. as like one of their th- three give them a pistol um, we get the the cane knife versus the ak bayonet which is just used handheld and is called uh the combat knife that's in the Saddam Pol Pot episode then we have in Teddy versus Lawrence, we have the Bowie Hunter versus the Jambia Dagger. And now in this episode, we got the Kukri, because you can't not have the Kukri, right? Uh, versus the Camelus, the K Bar. And I think what those tests really show, like the logic they're going off of is like, we're going to have the bigger knife versus the smaller knife. And they do end up giving the edge to the smaller knife in the Saddam episode, I think, because they want to make the edges even, because that's four weapons in that episode. But the Jambia dagger gets the edge, and the Kukri gets the edge. Now, I'm not, I've never argued against any of those knives getting the edge. I think the problem is is that it does not make for good TV. Like, these tests are always the most boring. They go for, like, two minutes. They have, like, two minutes of screen time. And you know which one's going to get the edge. And if anything, what this test did for me was demystify the Kukri. Like, the Kukri was cooler when they were talking about it than when we had the test because, like... I think what what's his face Nick shows you that like the smaller knife can be just as deadly like you you can go to town on a side of beef with whatever size knife and make it look really brutal and and kill you 
Um, and I think they really botched that. Like, it, it's one thing they botch in these episodes. Like, there should not be a fucking knife category. They, you need a pistol or a grenade or something. This is a modern matchup. Um, I know we're trying to stick to the roots, and I'm sure the biggest reason it's done is for money because it's cheaper to have two knives face off against you. Like, you, we, the three of us could do a K bar versus a Kukri <laughs> test, right? Um, you don't have to pay for like an expensive gun or some weird French ammo from World War II to do the test, set up a bunch of targets. Like, it's just a knife test, but it's not good at all. Um, when you have like the Viking and the samurai, I promise this is, this is relating to what I'm talking about. You have like the great axe versus the naginata, or even the long sword versus the katana. Okay, long sword and katana, they're both swords. They both are going to do the same thing, hack and slash. But they're so different. Like, they're different in the way they're built. They're different in the way that they're used by their particular warrior. You get an insight into culture and tactics with those. With this test, this Kukri and K-Bar test, it's like you have a six foot nine man come in and just butcher three targets. He's taking out years of repressed emotion on these foam dummies. And then you have a uh, regular sized dude who's not six foot nine. I'm not going to call him little because he's probably not. Like a guy who's not six foot nine come in and he's throwing fucking head kicks at sides of beef. And I was just like, wow, this test looks fucking lame. <laughs> and why is it in this episode? Give us a bomb, yo. You guys can fake a good grenade. They've done it a million episodes. Give us an explosion or a handgun as a sidearm. I know that these two warriors in particular, like the Foreign Legion is known for fixing bayonets and charging and the Kukri, their whole battlefield uh, example that we're going to get in a second is this ambush with the knives. But I think it's a repeated mistake they make throughout season three where they're like, we're going to have a big knife versus a little knife. And what you end up with is that neither really has an edge. Like, did the Kukri really do that much more damage than the fucking Camelus in this test? No. So what? I don't, know. I don't even know where I'm going with this rant, but it pissed me off, damn it. <laughs> yeah. So I'll leave you guys with this. My thoughts exactly. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll nice. leave it at whatever the fuck that was. They should have just gave Nick both knives and then seen what he could do more damage with. Because <laughs> right, he's, he's a tall guy. Yeah, because he's a big guy. Right. Let's go on to Max Chalk Talk. So first off, we have what I believe is this unnamed battle of 30 Gurkhas killing 80 Japanese. Represent. Um, it's called um, improv improvisation on the ground. <laughs> it's called World War II. Ever heard of it? Right. Uh, <laughs> Lucas, what can you tell us about Untitled Battle number thirty-six <laughs> AB? <laughs> Untitled Battle sixty-nine. Mm -hmm. Um. So, I just want to point out that the Gurkhas use a real battlefield tactic here, uh, taking out this Japanese troop that is more than twice their size. So they highlight this on the show. During World War II, they find these Japanese soldiers moving through a trail and using their small group knowledge and tactics, they find Emphasis a way. Emphasis on small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they send a small group of Gurkha soldiers out in front of the moving troop and prepare an ambush behind them as well. Gurkhas in front, I guess, kind of jump out and they go boogie, boogie, boogie with their knives, which makes the Japanese fold back on themselves. And as they move backwards, it's right into the Gurkha's actual trap. And the Gurkhas mow them down. 30 Gurkha men wiped out 80 Japanese men using superior battlefield tactics and knowledge of their terrain. Single-handedly won World War II right there. Okay. And a compelling case. Matt, why don't you counter with the 
battle that is at least named the Battle of Bir Hakim. Yes. <laughs> Let me. Uh, so, <laughs> Bir Hakim. Uh, the FFL holds the fortress against the German and Italian forces at 10 to 1 odds. Uh, I wrote that. I, I wrote just a total summary of this shit. Because um, the show did pretty well with their summary as far as what you need to know. Um, the 13E Demi Brigade of the Foreign Legion was supported by some French colonial troops as well as the 1st Artillery Regiment. And they set up in the fortress Bier Hakim, which was built by the Ottomans. Uh, due to their holding action, it extended German supply lines and it delayed Rommel's advance into Egypt for the first battle of El Alamein. No. Shout out, friend of the show. Um, the holding of Bier Hakim was also a major factor in the Germans suspending their invasion of Malta. So. Um, I think the tactic, because Lucas does have a good point. What they're doing is they're just holding, they're holding the damn line. Yeah. Uh, the active defense hol- as opposed to the inactive defense where they just do nothing and let them take it. <laughs> yeah, they, they held the line and it is pretty impressive. Um, you know, Rommel basically expects to roll right through this thing and... His forces meet, like, ferocious opposition, I think is how it's described. Um, These guys hold out. They kill a whole lot of Germans. They waste a whole lot of time. That's the biggest factor, is, like, not only did they extend supplies that should have been going somewhere else, but they wasted, like, so much time. The Germans, man, they love doing that in World War II. It's just, like, they can't... They... For the French, they went a, they went around the Maginot line, and they that was the last time they did that. For the rest of the war, they're like, I don't care if we have... <laughs> I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let Stalingrad go. Um, speaking of Stalingrad, uh, I'm sure the field, field marshal Paulus uh, would have loved if his commander had let what the French Foreign Legion do, which is uh, they sneak out. You know, at nighttime, they find a weak part in the enemy's perimeter and they sneak out. Um, Notoriously, the field marshal wanted to do that at Stalingrad after they got surrounded, but Hitler uh, said he could not. (laughs) So, um, and yeah, I mean, they, they did a decent job describing it. And it was, it, I did laugh, Lucas, I did laugh out loud because they did it in Deadliest Warrior fashion, where the narrator's like, and prevented Nazi world domination. <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong. <laughs> like, one... huge, like, historical yeah. moment of this battle. Like, huge impact on, like, you know, World War Two. But I don't think it's necessarily a battlefield tactic, per se, of just holding a fort. They probably could have found yeah. a better example of, like, an actual, like, maneuver or something that the FFL did. I, uh... I think they picked this because this is probably the shining example of the French Foreign Legion. And I would only say that I don't know all of their missions that they ever did. But I would only say that because this is definitely their uh, best showing in World War II, which is the biggest war. So, you know, I feel like it just automatically becomes the most famous and what they did was wild. I mean, they held this fortress, and it did contribute to the Axis losing in North Africa, which was pivotal to the entire war. Um, but, you know, uh, saying that they prevented Nazi world domination with the battle, I mean, I guess. But there was a lot of other stuff that happened in that uh that time span as well (laughs) what is the tactic sir instead of not shooting let's shoot write that down write that down genius well i will say it's not as though they were just in cover yeah i know and shooting they they did do some offensive maneuvers uh you know i have this picture here this is from the battle and this is just an example of 
the French Foreign Legion would bravely sort of charge into the enemy's campments. So they wouldn't let them get set up. Uh, so they were making maneuvers in and around the fortress. They weren't just like sitting there and like shooting. But I think you do have a decent point, Lucas. While this battle might have been more impressive and had a greater impact, um, the Gurkha thing I thought was more impressive as like a tactic, really. Yeah. Like, hey, Matt, I got an offensive um, maneuver. Oh. <laughs> got him. Don't make me pull out the driving crooner. Again. <laughs> All right, I will. <laughs> Well, so that was exciting. Yeah, they just kind of glance over like this part too, and they're like, they prevented Nazi Germany from winning the war. Edge. Well, listen, guys, this we've established the battlefield tactics. This is the consolation prize. Yeah, n- none of this matters this, anyway. This is the prize. It only exists as the prize they give to the losers so that all of you nerds, who sat there and complained, you know, not me, but all of you nerds who sat there and complained when Alexander the Great lost, and you're like, but he was such a good, he was such a big brain genius. Um, well, here, they invented this category to give suckers like me, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, your guy was really smart. He, in fact, he was smarter than the other team. He still loses, though. <laughs> Don't worry. We're, I feel like we're going to be getting to the X Factor soon of these two teams of, like, apparently super soldiers. Right. Yeah, I, I do like that Dorian calls them near superhuman, which is pretty funny. <laughs> Even, like, the stat, like, we're going to get into it in a second, but, like, the stats they give them are, like, it's, like, part of the Terminator army. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let, let's go to the Robert Daly's Green Beret Sim Corner. So, the three stats that they discuss of these superhumans first is discipline Gurkhas with 88 and FFL with 76 I do like that Jeff leads into this category by being like and you know that brutal training of the French Foreign Legion I mean that's gotta instill a lot of discipline and Robert gives him this look like did Jeff not read like the script for this scene because he's like yeah right right you are ken and then he goes and then he goes that's why we gave the gurkhas the, <laughs> the engine discipline. what's that over there is that the script <laughs> right yeah. exactly yeah i noticed that too next we got training gurkhas with an 87 ffl with a 90 three point difference sure i guess i hate x factors so much dude i i'm gonna be honest with you guys i don't i don't mean to come off as like low energy or whatever but i could not have cared any less about these x factors well let me tell you these x factors just make it less fun to argue like in favor of my warrior because they just don't like make sense it's not fun to argue like when you watch a bs weapon test and like you can go back and forth and argue that. These are just, like, unfun to argue. Because yeah. you're just like, why? Like, who cares? Yeah. yeah well, uh, the the funny ones are shown at the beginning and yeah. never mentioned again. And that's the uh, that's the freaking uh, blood oxygen content. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, the anonymity, which they never cover. Yeah, like, that's uh, funny, and that's fun to argue. Like, you're not going to get any, mm-hmm. like, machete versus t-shirt arguments. What, what on. was Napoleon's anonymity? <laughs> what, what was the zero? zombie's anonymity? Yeah, like a fucking zero, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's definitely going to play a factor. Last, <laughs> I just want to say physicality. Gurkha's 91, 91 FFL, dude. 84. <laughs> so, 91. another instance of them not reading the script, I feel like, I don't understand yeah. why they didn't come up with another X Factor name for the altitude thing. Because obviously they keep harping on this and they have mm-hmm. to address it in X Factor. There's no question. This is the whole point of the entire episode is this altitude thing. They're like higher than the seals at 91. Yeah. And when I hear the word physicality, all short jokes aside, you think stature. How big are they? 
know, how much yes. stuff can they move? You're not thinking about stamina or lung capacity. So I thought... In, in fact, endurance is one I think they've used before. Right. And physicality, I could check real quick. Is that not used in the Joan episode to give William an edge that he's like bigger than her? Might be. I I wouldn't um, know, but um, I wouldn't be surprised. I am gonna fucking because that's what fucking up. physicality means, not lung capacity. You wouldn't say like yeah. it is. It is physicality. Joan sixty four, William seventy eight. Yeah, they were talking about his lungs there. Actually, yeah, I guess Joan should have. Uh, Got more red blood cells. Should have blood doped like uh, Lance Armstrong. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, exactly. Like that's not because William can run a better fucking five k than her. Like right. That's because he's bigger. What they use on Lawrence so, of Arabia? Because they said because they went on about how he can run like a marathon. What they what stat they use for that? Endurance, I think. Is that what the when the endurance Here. came in? Yeah, we just me, put stamina. The stamina meter. Yeah. Because endurance makes sense. Uh, X factors. Yes, endurance. Endurance. Teddy versus Lawrence. Lawrence got the edge because of his, you know, five minute mile or whatever the hell they kept saying. When we make season four, we just have to fucking jump the shark and put like health, stamina, uh, special uh, special attack meter. I'm xing the X factors for season four. No well, X factors. <laughs> <laughs> or at least be like, all right, here's the video game logic. I, I like um, for X factors, get rid of this. Well, this is for when we do season four. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked in season two when they would occasionally mention like one thing. Yeah. They would be like, and, you know, the, the Spetsnaz's X factor is their ferocious training. And it's like, all right, that's fair. And for this, I think it's I think it's not irrelevant to bring up the high altitude thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's irrelevant to like mention. Um, but yeah, some of this shit is just like I I, I honestly couldn't be fucked. I was like, I do not care. I don't even have the energy to argue about. I wrote like nothing under these X factors. I was yeah, just like... I didn't either. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so let's why we just go on to the sim, everybody's favorite sim, <laughs> Lucas. Uh, second to last sim ever. It is. It's the last serious sim on the show. Right. And, uh, uh, I don't know if any of you guys brought up in your reenactment notes, but uh, FFF had some really good ones for. He mentioned that uh, the Shaka, Shaka Zulu expert Jason Bartley plays one of the Legionnaires. Um, if you don't remember, those are the guys that did like the stick fighting <laughs> and stuff. Um, uh, you know, I apologize, but this is the only this is the best way to say it. There's one Black Legionnaire, and that's him. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> you'll know which um, one. <laughs> It is right. If you look up a picture can, of Jason Bartley, you'll you'll find him. I think he's like second <laughs> last to die. Like he's like the one that takes it down to the one v one when he dies. Yeah, and then uh, the Sun Tzu expert Johnny Yang plays one of the Gurkhas. Now, um, what would a Flashbox historical full... expert be doing acting on a TV show? Right. Flash Fox Full says he thinks he's the one who's killed when his Bren jams. Um, his only real cro- close up is right before he dies. <laughs> um, so there's that, and I want to say, okay, yeah, those were the two from the reenactment that I thought were cool. Some deadliest warrior alumni mentioned in here. Shout out, because they're running out of budget. They need to bring me. <laughs> and we do this again, please, Jason, my buddy. Do me a favor. Huh? He talks like Watto. <laughs> hey, Jason, do careful, me a favor. Careful, Craig. <laughs> careful. I know. I, that was a Watto impression. I wanted to be clear. <laughs> Watto like, is a character in Star Wars. You like Watto? Yeah. He had slaves, bro. 
I thought you were, were going to do like a D's nuts joke. No. <laughs> I don't like water. <laughs> All right. The reenactment. Yeah, the reenactment of stalling. <laughs> I wonder what that's from. There was an Instagram reel or something I watched earlier. And this guy was like talking to his girlfriend and he had like a little Lego of Wado. And he's like, hey, honey, do you like this guy? And she goes, yeah, he looks cool. He goes, he had slaves, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Waddle's awesome. Anyways, <clears throat> welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to what is the last serious sim on the show. We've had a pretty good run of three seasons where real warriors take each other on in this completely made up clusterfuck of a simulation. But this is the last one before everything is literally made up. Second last time, I am your grand, it says grandson master. That's pretty funny. Uh, grand sim <laughs> master Lucas. I am your grandson. Um, I will be leading you on a journey, a journey back to World War II, where the Gurkhas take on the French Foreign Legion. Not in real life, though. Now that the testing is done, the correct height and blood cell data has been entered. It's time to raise your fingers and smash that enter button. <laughs> We open up on the jungle as the French Foreign Legion has a camp set up ready, of, ready to actively defend it if the need be. Meanwhile, some tiny ass microscopic Gurkhas are sneaking through the woods scouting. <laughs> the, the FFL guys trade off who's keeping lookout, but he must be blind because he couldn't see the Gurkhas cutting the fence thing just slightly in the background behind a log. Just then, they get impatient, and we get some fire from the Enfield rifle, and the FFL jump into action. Both teams drop down and open up with some light machine gun fire, literally just unloading on each other from like 20 feet away. One of the FFL guys decides to unactively defend his position, gets up to run away, and gets shot. <clears throat> but then we get a kill as one of the Gurkhas is gunned down. <laughs> Your face is frozen, and it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I have Stephen. <laughs> just put that screenshot up for the. <clears throat> then we get a kill. Oh, fuck. <laughs> well, Brendan, leave it. Brendan, leave it. <laughs> <Man. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> okay. move. I can't even do anything. I'm, he looks like I'm he's the guy running away in the sim. <laughs> Put like a French Foreign Legion hat on Matt. <laughs> we can't move on until so Matt sees this. Matt, I've got to put it in the group me again. Oh, now he's back. Oh, you're back. Hey, this is what you look like <laughs> in like two minutes. I accidentally put Heimlich in there again. <laughs> I like it better when I'm texting. Oh, yeah. I look, I look like I'm 100 years old. <laughs> you look like the old guy from Prometheus. I look like a really old dude. <laughs> Since I'm, we're already off track. I'm like the cat. I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so uh, we, we come back. The, the French Foreign Legion guy uh, gets gunned down, <clears throat> but we get a kill for kill as one of the Gurkhas is gunned down from the MAS-36. The French team <laughs> retreats. Imagine that. And the Gurkhas continue to press forward. <laughs> Most of this battle at this point is pretty much just back and forth, continued machine gun fire with occasional grunts and oh sounds. Uh, but oh shit, one of the Gurkhas goes down. The two are advanced. This is the guy. This is the guy. He runs out and his gun jams his Bren, which leads him to get gunned the fuck down in this really shitty death animation. That's the guy. Uh, one of the other Gurkhas pops up, shoots the FFL guy before he can celebrate. We're down a 3v3. Suddenly, silence falls as one of the Gurkhas is sneaking around the camp and a French foreign legion guy pops up and gets a headshot. But we get another kill for kill as a Gurkha quickly guns him down. We get some more back-to-back -back fire, but the Gurkhas quickly decide to get out of dodge, and the FFL guys give chase. But they lost sight of them until one of the Gurkha guys sneaks up behind the FFL, buries that kukri into the back of his head. We get literally an identical kill just the other way around. Literally, this entire fight is just trading kill for kill in like the exact same fashion. 
But anyways, it's 1v1 now, and it's a knife fight. Both of them try to juke each other out a couple times, and we get some knife sounds as the Gurkha catches the FFL guy on his face. They both continue swinging wildly until the foreign legion guy just punches the Gurkha in the face. He goes in for the kill blow, but gets his blade stuck into a tree for some reason. The Gurkha then goes behind him and starts slashing him, and even gets like a roundhouse kick in there. Which is not effective. No, no, no. According to Nick. The Gurkha slashes him a couple more times. And remember, Dorian says this at one point. I don't remember at what part of the show. You can get stabbed 20 times and still live, according to Dorian. (laughs) (laughs) But one of the slashes lands on the FFL guy's neck. He falls down and the Gurkha lets out a victory roar. Um, I'll be honest with you. Not the best sim. It's... Trying to make this one funny was like a, a struggle. It just, uh, it was just kind of like kill for kill, tons of machine gun fire, and uh, yeah, it was an all right sim, but it just like there wasn't too many Guys, like memorable moments from it. Hey, can I can I say it? This was a hyped episode. I walked away from it thinking, decent episode. Is this episode boring? Well, here's what I think about this episode. And why don't we say this for final thoughts? Because I have a good answer for that. I just want to get everything out of the way. Because I think that there's something poignant that I swear just discovered. And I I think it's... I I think it'll give closure. I gotta be honest with you guys. I didn't hardly write anything about the X Factors. I wrote no final thoughts. My, My sheet is blank in the final thoughts section. Which is usually... I have to fucking edit because I had so much just diarrhea to spurt out of my mouth about the episode and uh, I have nothing. So maybe we can save that when we get to final thoughts, but uh, I don't feel like it's a bad episode, but I'm interested to see what you guys have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got some good. Um, I would say I, I'm going to say yes and I'll explain it later, but I'll say yes to that. And I'll also say no for a, a pretty okay. apparent reason. Okay. So let's get the stats out of the way. So the winner, the Gurkhas. Battles won. Gurkhas won 2,619, which is 52%. FFL won 2,138, which is 48%. Weapon effectiveness, the BAR uh, versus the Bren. Bren had 35% versus the BAR 65%. The Enfield, 58% to the Masses, 42%. The Kukri, 56% to the Kamalas, 54%. Kamalas, whatever. Yeah. Um, And then they bring out Fatigue Rate, which we've never seen before. Last episode, (laughs) Fatigue Rate. Gurkha's (laughs) 5.02% and FFL, 10.9%. Just to hammer home... Red blood blood cells. Is that right. just like so exhausted you can't even like pick up your knife anymore? You're just like you're like I quit. Yeah, Kill me. You're out of strain and you're just yeah. It, what's a normal fatigue rate? I guess because they say that the FFL is really well trained, but apparently they have more than double the fatigue rate of a Gurkha. So I don't know. Right. What's my fatigue? Right? <laughs> I get tired, you know, just fucking sitting down to watch Deadly Story. <laughs> I'm I'm exhausted right now talking about it. <laughs> right. Um, well, let me let me give my um, kind of final well, thoughts. I want to say too, Robert Daly goes on camera and he goes, historically, the Bren gun had malfunctions in the field. No, it didn't. Yeah. Uh, before your final thoughts, Craig, some notes on the uh, results. Okay. Uh, we've got Robert Daly added again. Quote, it was a really close match. <laughs> <laughs> Literally every, every fucking episode. Um, for the record, I always like to say relative to season three, was it a close match? It was not really. It was in the dead middle of the pack. It's the fifth closest out of 10 matchups. So right in the middle. It does look close, but by season three standards, 
It's almost like they made it meaningless in season three. Um, so there's no blowouts. Uh, my only other note is uh, I'm not surprised by the matchup being as close as it is. The so Warriors seem pretty comparable throughout the episode. However, the weapon results are kind of vexing to me. It did not seem like that big of a gap between any of these guns, so I was surprised all categories weren't much closer. Also, this is a matchup where we need... Oh my god, broken record, but we need the individual weapon total. I know, I'm so tired because of percentages. Because the BAR blows out the Bren, which I'm not necessarily agreeing with, but... By their logic, it does. Isn't longest range Wait, usually the most effective? And you would think that the LMGs are the most deadly weapon in this. The only counter argument I could see is that one guy in the squad has an LMG and the other four have rifles. But even then, the amount of firepower that that thing's putting out, like how many kills is a knife getting? I want to know, damn it. I want to know. And Robert Daly is keeping me from that. So, uh, very weird. Right. I agree. Well, let me get to my final thoughts. Um, and then I don't have too much to say, but this, this might, I think be what's going on. I think this is very appropriate as the ultimate swan song of deadliest warrior, because this is exactly what people asked for and what they wanted from Deadliest Warrior and why <laughs> the true form of Deadliest Warrior is this enigma that we've been trying to sort of figure out this entire journey. Um, this is an episode where you have two really niche, you know, kind of interesting warriors that a lot of people know about, not something super common. You have, and they have interesting backstories. Same era, so no issues like with with time frame. Um, you have in-depth gun tests they're tested against each other in the same test you have mac bring up these in-depth arguments beyond just the surface level of uh you know sight pictures and all this stuff getting into like the 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 meat of it um you have um you know all of the in discussing the battle tactics all through the history of Deadliest Warrior, people are complaining that it's not accurate enough. This is almost them giving up and saying, all right, this is what you really you want. We're going to give it to you. Now, based on our audience's feedback, a lot of you people really like this episode. Me personally, I did not really feel anything. So again, we run into this Deadliest Warrior problem of if we were to make season four, and we will, um, how, we, how do you capture that lightning in a bottle of season one? Because you can't artificially make it so goofy and shitty and, you know, all the all the fun stuff from season one and, not, and make it a farce. But also you can't necessarily take it so serious because then the soul is gone. So really, this is, I think, a perfect swan song for Deadliest Warrior. Exactly what people want. And I feel like this is the... um uh what's Look, that man, phrase it's like the rabbit's where's foot Ch where's chuck liddell yeah <laughs> okay also green beret spetsnaz six weapons per team all right take <coughs> fucking notes yeah i know they can't do that for every episode but they should all right they should budget for it because this shit is weak you get one lmg two you know two lmgs two bolt action rifles and those are fine and then it's like we get a knife test, and it's like, okay, I know the Kukri is iconic, but it just like, I don't know. Imagine if Green Beret Spetsnaz, let me put it this way. Imagine if that episode they did the shotguns, then they did the M4 versus the AK, and then they did the ballistic knife and the E-tool, and then they just ran the sim. It would be boring. It would be a lot more boring because <laughs> it's like, I don't know. <laughs> right. It's weird that like these episodes are the same amount of time, yet so much more happens in Green Brave Roots Bats Yeah. It's 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 odd. Um so I, I would just say in closing, what what's the phrase? It's like that thing, it's like a, a something wish whenever you get what you ask for. You know what I'm talking about? It's like an expression. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're talking about. Like 
your monkey's paw kind Thank of you. thing. Thank you. Not the rabbit's paw. It's a monkey's paw type uh, yeah. scenario. The monkey's fist. The monkey. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so what are your final thoughts, Lucas? Yeah. Uh, we, this interested. episode would have benefited heavily from an aftermath because I want to see Nick on the aftermath after he lost. <laughs> he's got like a little tiny chair. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he would have been so obnoxious. I feel like on the like, it's all made up. Like this show is bullshit. Yeah, you know he would have yeah. been pissed. Um, he would have been like computers Chinese. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this episode is it a good episode or is it? You said is it boring? Um, I think parts of it are the weapons are just a little bit too similar. There's nothing to like, I don't know. The test could have been like pizzazzed up a little bit more. Why this episode is good though is because Nick and Rostra make this episode good with their constant arguing and like bickering back and forth. They those are definitely like the standout points of this episode for me. And that that's a good point and th- to your point they both give it all in their tests yeah like like you said rostra's booking it um you know nick is uh both of them are pretty good shooters nick goes really hard in the paint on the knife test which i think is better for the show to be honest with you um so they're not quite like the best experts we've had on. Like we've definitely had some that were like, you know, they're like B tier experts on this. Uh, and they definitely give it the all, but like, yeah, parts of the other, this, like the episode, I almost like zone out a little bit on sometimes when they're not on the screen. It's just the whole, yeah. the season three with this X factors and taking it a little bit too seriously at times. It kind of like, I don't know. This episode well, could have been it, a little bit better, in my opinion. It's it's the same old fuckery, but now they dress it up like it's a military channel, like docu series. Yeah. Instead of a Spike TV reality show, which is what Deadliest Warrior is at its heart. And I think maybe this episode, if it is that popular is popular because of the warriors in it. Oh yeah. Uh, Cuz one of the biggest one of the biggest feedbacks I see about this episode is that the Gurkhas are cool. You know, no one knows who the hell the Gurkhas are and they watch this episode and they learn more about the Gurkhas and it's like oh the Gurkhas are badass or they know about them already and they're like yo shout out glad the show did these guys justice. And you know, that's fine. Um, but I, I don't think it's anything against these warriors that the episode might not be like my favorite. Yeah. You know, I think we hit a I'm bit not of, even, I'm not even trying to sound dumb. Like, you know, Ooh, you need to be, you know, more stupid for me to like it, you know, but, um, just too, I don't know. <laughs> I had nothing to say. I think I have nothing to say. I think I'm reliving like a little bit of my childhood of why I like remembered not liking season three that much because we went into it and it was like a roller coaster. Like we're like season three is really good. And, you know, we're click, 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 going up the rails and then we're riding down. And then by this point, I feel like there's almost like some season three fatigue going on with all these X factors and just the ridiculous stuff. But like the end of the it episode, fatigue. yeah, it's like numbing at this point where like, you're like season yeah. three gives you a little bit more fatigue than the other seasons. I needed altitude training before this episode. <laughs> right? um, it is fatigue. And another thing I'll know, I just thought about this was um, maybe lack of a good heel as far as the warriors go. So like you know, we all talk about, how the Legion experts are like, you know, kind of douchey or whatever throughout the episode. But the F- French Foreign Legion, like, here they are fighting the Nazis in, like, their <laughs> battlefield tactics section. Um, and we have talked about before, I've given my opinions that these modern matchups are made better when you have, like, a Sonny Puzikas or when it's, like, the North Koreans right because it's it's a it's easy for you to root for you know the square jawed american boy scout to like fight the commie right on on the episode 
And with this, again, it's like, I don't know, man. Is it, were you really that, was anybody like tensed up at the end? Like during the reenactment? Were you biting your nails being like, no. Are the Gurk are the Gurkhas gonna win? You know, <laughs> like I mean I wanted them to win because it was my team. I think you're absolutely right. There is like it's two good guys essentially like facing off against each other. So it's not as fun to like choose a side. Really. You're just I, I'm thinking maybe that's just part of it. Yeah. Going along with the things that both of you said. Like I think you hit a lot of really good points. And yeah, in a way, it is sort of poetic. The sw- the swan song of Deadliest Warrior, only to be closed by greater poetry <laughs> with next week's episode. And I will say, maybe that is part of it as well, is me knowing... What's next? <laughs> ...that Vampire vs. Zombie is right around the corner and thinking about just how bizarre and funny that episode is and all the stuff I want to talk about. Um... And it's almost like all of my energy, I was thinking about that episode. I, I was doing notes for this episode. And I was thinking about that one. And I'm like, uh, maybe that's also part of it. It's just it's it's being put right next to this one. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Not my least favorite episode. I didn't hate it. I remember I enjoyed watching it. And I was like, that was decent. Yeah, I liked but, watching it. Definitely. Yeah. As we're talking about it, though, I'm like... I don't know if there's that much to talk about, really. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, it was like a good episode. I get why a lot of people like this episode, but there's no, like, I don't know, no, like, big lasting moments from it for me. Hmm. Anything else to say, Craig? Nothing. Uh, can you move your head for a second, Brendan? Don't you think, like, Matt's background look like Steel Ball Run characters? <laughs> Come on. He said he he emphatically shook his head yes. He agreed with everything I said. I have a little hat. There you go. Now I want to announce for everyone, you know, I don't want to end this episode on a downer. So I will be taking um four things of pre workout before the next episode to, you know, <laughs> I want to be hyped. <laughs> yeah, I we don't even have definitive plans for the next episode, you know, really. We've talked about it so many times, but as of right now, there are no definitive plans of how we're going to tackle this. It's got to be going to be not. It's got to be different, yeah. At least in some respect, because could you imagine us sitting here talking about fucking the zombie bite, the vampire bite? <laughs> No, like, oh, I, I want some excitement. I want some like. Energy. I can. There's there's a lot to talk about. So. Right. I don't know. We'll we'll see what we want to do. If we want to do something special for it, um, somehow get everybody involved, like everyone that's ever been on the show. <laughs> yeah. What a mess. What a mess that would be. Right. Um, we'll we'll figure it out. I can't believe we're yeah. nearing the end here, boys. Last one. It's been a long been a journey. Week. Yeah, and we we still <laughs> yeah. have some episodes to record after Songbirds Empire, Empire, so it won't be the end. We still got some cleanup to do, but. Um, I want to say Back for Blood yeah. Season 3 will be out by 2031. It's probably like the anticipated right. release date. At least. <laughs> At least. Um, it will probably be out before Winds of Winter. <laughs> right, um, you can bet that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in case anybody's wondering, for a little preview for next week, uh, for our last regular episode episode, I will be hosting... Lucas will be Team Zombie. Yeah. And Craig will be Team Vamp. So. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, you're doing, you're doing another funny thing. I'm sure you'll get the picture. Yeah. I'll put it in. Um, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun. Well, that's it, gentlemen. Uh, thank you all for watching. This was an, a highly anticipated episode. Hope we lived up to it. <laughs> um tune in for the last episode of deadliest warrior coming whenever and as always stay deadly hey stay deadly stay deadly <laughs>